and hits rocks and everything and, and, and the horse moves through terrain. Um, as as the the as pressure is exerted here, it actually, if anything, creates a squeezing effect on the lama uh, uh, at impact, uh, and and uh, uh, so so that the lama aren't getting this this uh, separational ripping and tearing type of a force all the time. In our flared situation, which is what we're dealing with here. We still have our epidermal lamina attached to part of the hoof wall. We still have our dermal lamina. They are always just surrounding P3. But then we have this gap in the middle. And in this gap, uh, depending on how it happened, how fast the separation occurred, um, uh, a lot of different factors um, covered in under the horse. That this may be a gap, a hole, um, stretched epidermal lamina, it may be filled with a f infection. It may also be solid with, with, with lamellar wedge. And so that it appears to have a tight white line at ground level. And this is one that a lot of people miss. Nobody misses a hole here, but a lot of people will miss miss this when, when, uh, when it's filled in with lamellar wedge. If you look close, you can see the difference, but a lot of people don't look close enough. But at any rate, how, whatever is filled in in between, you can visualize what now, when the, as the horse moves through terrain, what the force right here is doing. Instead of a compressional force as we had there, we have, we have a ripping and tearing force. So the horse is producing connected lamina at the top all the time, but, but this is being just ripped apart. Um, uh, and for all the debate about shod versus bare versus boots, uh, 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 this is one area where, where I think there's just little room for debate. You just can't grow out these big situations in shoes because if you're attaching um, to the hoof wall the, the, and supporting from the hoof wall, then, then, then you, you can't reverse that force. Um, and so so uh, it, it is very difficult to shoe a horse that's in this situation. So even if a horse is eventually going to be shot, um, doing what I'm going to show you here long enough to grow in a well-connected wall um, can really, really benefit the horse long term um, if you grow in a good foot, bare foot, and then, and then shoe the horse later. Not the way I do it, but a whole lot better than letting the horse run around like this for its whole life. So what I'm going to do basically, um, and there's some variance to this. Um, for, for the most part, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that, that this flare isn't there. So in other words, I will pretend that I have an eighth of an inch white line. This is all in my imagination. Um, pretend that I have a little eighth of an inch rim of wall sticking up. Pretend that I have an eighth of an inch wide flat bearing surface. Okay? And, and pretend that I have this bevel on the hoof wall. So in other words, my trim is going to be about right here. And then I'll take, I keep my any trimming on the outer wall in the lower one third. So I may trim something like that and leave it like that and that would be a setup trim. I'll say a maximum setup trim that I would do in, in most cases. If I have a thin sole, then, then I may be a little bit more conservative with the walls. I don't want to make the horse tenderfooted. That works against me. And, and if the horse has a nice thick sole and is on soft terrain, or you're using boots, you go ahead and do the more aggressive trim, just basically setting the footprint where it would be if the, if the horse had well-connected walls. Um, so a minimum trim that I might do 
would be to trim this to the level of the sole and then put my bevel on from there. If I find a need to do that, I will come back much more frequently, say come back two weeks later instead of, instead of four or six weeks later as I might on the more aggressive trim. And, and these are decisions that I make on the field. Not a lot of difference there, but, but, but leaving a little bit of wall bearing can really be helpful if you have a thin sole situation or a very weak, sensitive frog situation. Now before I leave this picture, I want to throw in a side note here that, that I draw this bevel on the wall. And for most horses, um, in most terrains, that, that steep bevel on the wall is going to be just right. And people think, well, you're only leaving an eighth of an inch bearing surface, but then they're not considering the terrain. As this thing sinks in the terrain or hits rocks, you're very much loading this part of the wall. And, and Nothing that casts a shadow is, is, is passive on the horse. Um, but, and particularly it comes up with draft horses a lot, <clears throat> but any horse, what if the horse does live on a hard, flat, concrete surface? Or what if the horse is, is, is a carriage horse being worked on the streets? Then, if you trim this exact same way, then you absolutely would be only standing on a tiny bearing surface and you would cause excessive wear in your, in your hooves by trimming that way. So the carriage horses that we do, or any horse that's living and working on hard, flat terrain, will trim more like that. <clears throat> Generally at this point we're talking about a maintenance trim though too. This type of trim would not be nearly as effective for growing in well-connected walls. But then, I would never recommend a, recommend a horse to have the hoof walls um, out of function, uh, as we're talking about here, be work barefoot on the streets. You would wear right through your sole. So, what I'll typically tend to do is go ahead and do my rehabilitative type trim to the horse and then have it work in boots when it's on that terrain and not even talk about barefoot riding until I've grown in a well-connected wall. At that point, I'm going to switch over to a trim more like this when we, when we start talking about riding barefoot on the streets. Very, very important that you, that you can adapt that trim to your terrain right there. Another very important feature that comes up a lot on draft horses while I've got this picture, is this arch of sole is also specifically suited to a horse moving through soft or rocky or any terrain they can sink into. Then the sole's getting pressure, the P3's being supported from underneath. But again, on your horses working on the street, and this would apply to a horse working on a hard paddock as well, the sole will, the, the, will, will always try to, to fill in. And, and so it's seeking a more flat, just so it can expand. It, it, that, and you don't have to do this. The horse does it. That you'll have about a quarter of an inch in here close to the frog out in front of the bars. You'll have about a quarter of an inch um, height above a flat plane. And the sole will wear all will be all the way to the hoof wall, and the hoof wall and the sole will be worn even. And that allows for expansion room. And and, uh, and but when it expands to be supported on the street, it's very important to, to, to stress that. If you have a horse that's working on the street and you're fighting, cutting, trying to keep a concave sole, you're working against the horse. The foot's going to be trying to adapt to to that flat, flat environment, and you need to let it. Um, it was an interesting thing we saw with Milo, Ivy's carriage horse, that he was working on the streets and had this, and, and had this, this flat sole built in, and it worked very well. And then when Ivy and I started dating, and she started traveling with me, and she sold her carriage company, and, and we put Milo in the pasture, then, um, um, 
then all this all this that it built in here you know, fell out and he had a nice concave concave foot and, and it started exfoliating and then I was taking it with the hoof knife as it was exfoliating and, and, and then he ended up with a nice concave sole but that foot changed from being a flat terrain horse to a, to a, a softer um, or I should say yielding terrain horse. So very, very important considerations there. All right, so going back to the bottom of the foot on this horse, and basically in the, in the beginning, I just cleaned crud. Um, um, all this crud, all the cruddy frog and exfoliating sole, and just not really a lot of cutting here, just, just, just taking away the, the gunk that was there so that you can sort of see what's going on better. This is, this is just a, a, a couple of minutes later looking at this foot. Several things I want to talk about. Um, one, the, this, this, if you see this divot um, at the front of the foot, uh, the, the coffin bone will also have this shape. Um, this, is, this, this seems to be, it needs to be studied more, um, but it's an exaggerated crena in the coffin bone, and that will run all the way up the dorsal aspect of the, of the, of the coffin bone um, as a groove. And you see it very commonly on draft horses, but you can see it in any breed. Um, it's also very common um, on long-term laminitic horses. And there's different schools of thought on 